Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for the power of God. Thank you for this service, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that abides. We thank you, Lord, that we can appropriate it this morning for this hour of need. Let the mighty power of the Holy Ghost touch every heart, every listener. Let no one leave this service this morning without being moved. Move us, Lord, until there is a reaction in all of our hearts to the mighty word of the Lord, the quickening power of God. We know that you are here, you abide, and you're with us now. Every word that proceeds out of our mouth this morning shall bring glory to his matchless name. Amen. Power over sin. I have an unusual kind of respect for the word sin. It's the same kind of respect I have for a rattlesnake coiled for an attack. For over eight years now, I've ministered the very gates of hell, and I've seen every variety of sin there is, and I've wept my way through human graveyards of depravity and hopelessness. My congregation has already been to hell and back. Those that I minister to walk only at night, and their only consolation is that there are so many others just like them. Sunshine to them is painful. Life is a dreaded ordeal. Pleasure is only another form of pain. Death is a desired haven, a way out of bondage and total demon possession. My parish, of course, is the gutter. The big people here are the drug addicts, the burglars, the muggers, the alcoholics, the gangs, the debs and dolls, and the con artists. None of them very old in years, but all of them old in misery and pain. This is a world where the little people are born old. Children are conceived in the hates and shames and sins of their parents. Their tender little bodies become their enemies, used only to feed them drugs, disease, and liquor. They cry when they're born without any hope of being heard by men. They are born wishing they were dead. They are born to sin-cursed parents who spend every nickel on fifths of whiskey instead of quarts of milk. They land in the street jungle because it's better there than in their home. Hell to them is home. Satan rules supreme in the world that we minister to, the other half. He entices the young and the innocent. He enslaves them with appetites and habits that break down their morals, their health, and their integrity, waste their energies, and dissipate their strength and power, leaving them nothing but the pitiful wages of sin, death. Little well, skinny Carlos is a point in case, case in point. 17-year-old boy that I met in a basement 110th Street in Harlem. He had never in his 17 years seen the Brooklyn Bridge, though he lived in Brooklyn, uh, in uh, Harlem. He'd never been down to see the Brooklyn Bridge. Never been out of a 20-some block area in all of his life. His mother had left him when he was 14 years of age, and he moved into a basement. He was allowed to stay in that basement by firing, stoking the furnace. When I went down to look at his little room, I was shocked, and I've seen plenty. He had an old urine stench mattress on, right on the dirty floor. There were no doors or windows in that basement, and the coal came rushing through there in the winter. Rats. He had a little calendar, three years old, hanging on the wall, a little picture of his mother and an old burnout candle. A few rags that he used for blankets. The boy ate only what he could steal, a bag of oranges, a loaf of bread. He had a little needle, a set of works underneath the little stone. He sat there day after day, shooting narcotics into his vein and living his little world. The boy hadn't bathed in months, and I don't suppose he'd changed his clothes in at least three months. I was so shocked, I forced him to come to the center. We made him take a shower, we cleaned him up, gave him good clothes. Talked to him about the Lord, but he was so stunned he couldn't uh, understand. When I went down to the office later, about one o'clock in the morning, to finish some work, I felt rather warm inside that I could provide clean sheets, a nice bed, good clothes, and comfort for a boy who'd been sleeping in a basement. Two o'clock in the morning, a blood-curdling stream, and Carlos 
ran streaming down our halls and outside the door he hadn't even had his shirt on yet. He was naked from the waist up and carrying his shoes. Ran streaming down the street and disappeared. The next day I went over to find him. I saw him in a little candy store. I said, Carlos, what's the matter? He said, Pastor, you took my only security. This is the only life I've known. He said, you took it away from me. I had to come back. I can't stand it anywhere else. Skinny Carlos died two months later of hepatitis in the Queen's Hospital. I haven't forgotten that boy because Satan stripped him and left him nothing. Daisy, young lady I talked about last night, a prostitute, a narcotic addict, 32 years of age, came to live with us at Teen Challenge Center, walked out against advice. Because of constant drilling in her veins, her surface veins collapse. When it happens, they shoot in the leg, and then when those surface veins collapse, they shoot in the jugular vein and in the breast. Daisy had walked out against advice, warned that I would bury her if she didn't obey the Holy Spirit. Daisy was prostituting two months later on a rooftop, 110th Street and Madison Avenue. And she got $2 for her trick, as we call it. A drug addict later found she had that $2, chased her back up on the roof and demanded the money. She wouldn't surrender to him, and he pushed her off the roof, and she fell on the pavement, cracked her skull, and died instantly. He went down and took the two dollars from the corpse because Satan wouldn't even let her go into eternity with two dollars in her purse. Fernandez was paid in full on the rooftop in the Bronx, and I told about this to the young people last night. Five teenage boys shooting narcotics. Sixteen-year-old Fernandez died from an overdose. They tried to stick saltwater needles in his veins to shock him, beat him over the head with wet tiles, he still passed away. The next day, they're walking the street trying to work an angle. They had no money for a deck of heroin. Remembered the corpse laying up on the rooftop, stretched up against the stairwell. They went up and stripped him of his clothes, stripped the corpse, took it to a pawn shop, and got $6 for his clothes and left him naked because Satan wouldn't let Fernandez go into eternity even with the clothes on his back. This is the world that we work in, a world of sexual deviation, overrun with homosexuals and lesbians, thousands of sad, lonely people who live normal lives most of the week, but suddenly at the weekend they're overwhelmed by a power from another world that sets them apart from all other creation. They are marked with a sin and a corrupted streak that drives them to depths of sin and filth that our decent minds cannot even comprehend. They are driven to alcoholism, to mental institutions, and so often to suicide. I received the most indecent mail of any minister in the world. My own mother has had to answer my personal mail because we cannot even trust anyone else to open the mails that come to me. From men and women all over the world who detail their obsessions and their deviant lives and life patterns. These pitiful letters break hearts at our center. My mother has blushed many times. Tragic stories of bondage, demon possession, satanic attacks, obsessive habits. Stories from laymen and ministers from many nations around the world who beg for our prayers and deliverance. Prostitutes who wet their tears with their letters with their tears. Homosexually bound ministers who threaten suicide unless they can be set free once and all from their sin. Drug addicts who write jail epistles about the physical torture of cold turkey who make sad and pitiful appeals for one last chance before they commit suicide. Friends, the sin cult that I'm talking about even now plagues the church of Jesus Christ. Our religious and secular campuses, colleges, Bible schools, and almost every Christian stronghold today, Satan has come down having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. I've been lecturing in some of our Christian campuses around the country, and this year has been one of the worst disciplinary problems in the history of our schools. Our own school, Pentecostal, Methodist, and, and I, I can name some of the outstanding schools, Christian schools of our nation, for the first time in their history, are having problems that they can't even, can't even begin to control. Now, I've expected drinking, cursing, sexual promiscuousness, and deviation of every kind in the gutter where I preach, but now it appears that these same problems are causing many Christians to lose their first love. 
While the church has slept, the enemy has crept into soul tears. There is now winking at sin, no more concept of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Now, I expect things to get much worse in the parish that I am called on to minister to. It'll get worse and worse through time because God's word predicts it. Second Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The government, with all of its millions and medical knowledge, will not stop drug addiction. I predict that thousands of more will become addicts each passing year. I was just telling the young people last night that one of our major problems in New York City right now are the numbers of teenagers are going through the high school corridors, unscrewing the little caps from the fire extinguishers and getting high on its chemicals. Licorice now they find is addicting, habit forming, and they're going to have to outlaw licorice. Because kids are discovering that if you take enough of it, you can get it high. More prostitutes will sell their body and soul. Skid rows will become overcrowded. Teen gangs will continue to terrorize and rumble from city to city. Civil disobedience is going to spread. Disrespect for law and order will be rampant. Thrill murders are going to increase. Sexual deviates will prowl more and more streets, raping and abusing more and more helpless women. Crime is going to go out of control completely. College campuses will not be peaceful and calm again. They will boil over with a new kind of liberalism, existentialism, extens, well, anyhow, existentialist, existentialist. I remember preaching at, uh, just pardon me a minute here. Where is it? Berkeley campus. Out on Sproul Hall during the riots. They said they'll stone you. The communists and all their followers were over here screaming and hollering through the microphones. I stood up to speak and young people took their hats off. There were some 12 to 1500 young people standing around with their hands folded and I'd never seen anyone so respectful in all my life. And I wondered what it was and I turned around so happened the Teen Challenge Center there had brought along about five or six great big husky converted drug addicts who stood behind me with their hands on their shoulder. I would have listened too. I was in Buffalo, New York uh, for crusade and downtown in the city square I saw a group of kids, you know, these shaggy kids who iron their hair and wrinkle their clothes. Marching around the city square, band of bomb. One sign read, Johnson's a liar. Get out of Vietnam. Right in the middle of a little kid had a for sale sign. And to me, that described what was happening to our young people today. Just anything to try to show some spirit of rebellion. This will increase. And mark it down, and you're going to hear it this morning from this pulpit, you mark it down well. If it doesn't happen this summer, it'll happen next summer, and I believe it will happen this summer. We're going to have the greatest revolution, the most vile, violent race revolution the world has ever witnessed. It will start this time in Washington, Baltimore, Detroit, Oakland. These are the cities that are going to get hit the hardest, including New York. Los Angeles will have other outbreaks perhaps not as serious, but this will spread throughout the United States, and we're going to see. It hasn't even begun, my friends, because this is the sword of the Lord in the land. God has allowed it. This is the doing of the Lord. When a nation sins grievously against me, the Lord said, I will move against it with the sword of my hand. Bishop Pike and Bishop Robinson Incorporated and all these pipsqueak bishops will lead their herd of agnostic ministers deeper and deeper into the pits of confusion, sin and rantings and ravings against the cherished truths of the Orthodox Church. Liberals will be making pilgrimages to Rome to bend their knee to the power of the Pope. Backslidden Pentecostals and evangelicals will busy, be busy working more and more angles, getting involved in more and more red tape trying more and more orthodox procedures that have already proven unworkable. 
send out more and more slogans, dream up more and more paper evangelism, and stray further and further away from the simple, uncomplicated dreams of the fathers who founded their movements. God's Word predicts it. Movies will get dirtier and more descriptive. TV shows will compete for vileness and freedom to satisfy the sex-satiated generation of the United States. Newsstands will brazenly peddle smut written by demons and devils. Divorce laws will be eased, and the home life as we have known it will be ridiculed until it becomes acceptable to maintain mistresses and to indulge in extramarital relationships. It will become almost normal for college students to maintain sexual affairs while in school to keep up with the crowd. Moral standards are decaying, and now dishonesty, cheating, lying, and stealing has become a way of life, and God's Word predicts it'll get worse. More and more of our church kids will get pregnant. Others will lose the fire and backslide. Others will live phony lives and hide behind double standards. But in the midst of it, persecution will get hotter and hotter. Become more and more difficult to live a really overcoming life. Intellectuals will scoff and cry, come on over and set yourself free from your Puritan attachments and background. Intelligent Christian youth will seek to become relevant rather than repentant. They will become involved, but instead become entangled. God's word predicts it. All I hear today is about a church that needs to be relevant. God's word said it needs to be repentant. We talk about being involved, and instead we get entangled. I have never yet once seen a preacher who heads a civil rights demonstration stop the crowd and preach the gospel. And, and I just don't care what they think of me. Pastor, if you're going to march in a civil rights demonstration, stop the crowd, go ahead and march, but preach Jesus first. Then march. Never have we needed, and I have painted this picture, and I believe it's true, I have not overstated it, and all you have to do if you think I've overstated is to take a little tour with me through our major cities and see that I have understated it, if anything. But we have never so desperately needed a definition of power over sin as we need it now. In the past few months, I have literally been driven to my Bible for a definition of power over sin. I have to have answers. The people that I work with have to have an immediate answer. They have to have help and deliverance right now. Never have people fought such great inner battles as they fight today. The question I'm asked most in the gutter and in crusades, must I give in to this thing that has me in its grip? Is there no power over sin in my life? Do I have to go through the rest of my life as a cripple? obeying the impulses of my lower nature. A husband sat in my office with his face in his hands crying a few weeks ago. A lovely wife and two beautiful children. He'd been converted for five years. And he'd been seeking after God. But suddenly he turned to alcoholism. In fact, the night he reverted to alcoholism, he burned a bar down and hit the headlines. Came into my office, I said, why did you do it? Five years you were clean. He bowed his head and he wept. He said, Brother Dave, five years ago I had a secret sin. He named it. It's homosexuality. He said, I tried to overcome it. It lay dormant. Suddenly it overpowered me and I was so depressed. I went out and got drunk and I burned a bar down, told me the whole story. He looked up at me with tears streaming down his cheeks. And he said, Brother Dave, is there no victory? Is there no power over this thing? Do I have to be a slave the rest of my life? He said, if that's true, I want to end it all now. A much used evangelist from Denmark came to my office, greatly used of God, reaching thousands of souls. He said, David, 10 years ago, I was an alcoholic and I had the same problem that I mentioned to you just now. He said, God delivered me. Filled me with the Holy Spirit, and I have won thousands of souls. He said, for ten years I've moved in God. He sat there trembling. He said, three weeks ago, strange spirit came over me, and I found the old desire. It overwhelmed me, and I stood in the pulpit, and suddenly that craving, that desire hit me so hard. He said, I've come all the way from Denmark. I've read your book. 
You're the only man I think could help me, he said Brother Dave, and he stood. Though I've preached and though I've known all about the movings of the Holy Spirit, he said, I have no power over this. I'm driven like an animal, and unless I can get victory, I've got to quit preaching, and if I have to do that, suicide is next. And I get letters from all over the world. I watch drug addicts as they leave us and revert to their old life, and I see them on the street. They cry and read their Bibles half the night. They say, I can't help it. I'm on a toboggan slide. I'm going down and I can't stop it. You know, we have thousands of Christians around the world who fight a battle constantly. They have never had a definition of power over sin in their lives. They're buffeted and they're tossed by every little wind and wave of temptation. Told of burying Danny last night. Danny walked out, shot through the heart by a police officer. We buried him three weeks ago. I remember talking to Danny on the street before he was murdered. He say, Brother Dave, how can I get power over this craving for drugs? Why didn't God set me free when I got on my knees and prayed? Why didn't God take the desire away? He said, it's still there and I can't help it. He said, I don't want it. I despise it. I hate it, but I can't stop it. Don't think for one moment that only drug addicts and homosexuals fight this horrible battle against sin in the soul. It's the battle of every great man of God. It's your battle and it's mine. I know what it is to pray for a crucified life. And by the way, it's not scriptural to live a crucified life. Crucifixion is an act. You live the resurrected life. And I'm tired of people telling me they're living a crucified life. They've never even been able to say it is finished. The act of crucifixion is finished when you can say with Christ at the cross, it is finished, and then give up the ghost. I do not live the crucified life. I live the resurrected life, and the same quickening power that raised Jesus from the dead is in me. Hallelujah. And I live the resurrected life. Why don't you join me? I can give you the day. I can give you the day. I screamed in my little prophet's chamber, it is finished. And I've been preaching a sermon ever since God's not given anymore. He gave it all to Calvary. How could God give you something again he already gave you? He gave you, you, you know, friends, that there are not a handful of people in America that understand everything we need we already have in Jesus. All the righteousness the upon her. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Hold it. But I spent eight long months, and I'm going to just stop a minute and tell you how it happened. Eight months ago, nine months ago, I was walking from one building to another. We've got five on the block. Six now. We just about finished the half million dollar center for the glory of God. Oriental man stopped me on the street. Give me, give me his name. He said, Brother Dave, God sent me to you. He said, your ministry is too shallow. First thing he said. He said, God sent me from behind the Iron Curtain to tell you this. He said, you need to take a year off and get into the Word and understand the power of God. There's so many things that you haven't learned yet. You've got to get Dave Wilkson out of the way. And I got mad. I said, I'll tell you what you need, friend. I said, I'm the soul winner. And you come around here telling me, I said, that center's full of Converts and God's moving, God's blessing my life. I'm preaching to six and seven thousand a week now, and you telling me that I don't understand it. I said, I'll bet you just go around telling the preachers things like I said. You need to get in the chapel and get on your knees and humble yourself. He just smiled. He was a little hurt. He walked away. I was mortified because the truth always hurts. Went to the office and the telephone rang. Some minister. Didn't, I don't even remember his name. He said, it's not important. He said, for three weeks, I've sat at my phone. I've been fighting against it, but I just have to do it. He said, I had a vision of you, Reverend Wilson. He said, I don't know much about you, but God told me to call you, and I've got to obey it. He said, you were standing before thousands of young people, one of your crusades, and they all walked out on you. And you went to the edge of the pulpit, and you fell over dead, and you fell in a hole. And I went and looked in the hole, and everybody said, Dave Wilson is dead, and he was in his old clothes. He said, now, I don't know what that means, 
And I tell you, I just butt had it. I, I yelled at him. I said, I'll bet you're a homosexual or something, and you've just taken a vicarious throw out of humbling me. They said, get off this phone and leave me alone. Hmm. I went home, this double barrel attack hanging heavy over me, and I went to prayer. And God began to break through and said, I sent them both. I sent them both. Cancel all your crusades. Cancel everything. And stay in this room until you begin to understand the kingdom of God within you. Until you begin to see the power there is in Jesus Christ. Until you dip, lengthen your cords, you go deeper in the Lord. And it was in this process, eight months I tried, prayed, Lord, show me the crucified life. I've got to have a power of definition over sin. And I prayed and I strove and I fasted. I studied the lives of the great missionaries who spread the gospel around the world, and I found that they were fighting the same battle that I was fighting, that God never used one of them until they suddenly had a revelation of the power over sin that a man can obtain, that a man can live in complete victory in his life, not subject to these things. I studied the life of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had been used of God to send some 200 missionaries to China, raised up China Inland Mission, one of the greatest missionaries in the world. In the midst of this, when God was using him, Hudson Taylor cried out. Suddenly I felt the ingratitude, the danger, the sin of not living nearer to God. He said, I prayed, I agonized, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions, I read the word more diligently, I sought more time for meditation, but all without avail. Every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of my inner sin oppressed me. Now, this is a great missionary talking. It was known around the world. I knew that if I could only abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not. I would begin the day with prayer, determined never to take my eyes off Jesus throughout the day. But he said at the end of the day, my catalog of sin would increase. My position became continually more and more responsible. My needs greater for special grace. And I continually mourn that I followed Jesus at such a far distance, and I learned so slowly to imitate him. He said, I can't begin to tell you how buffeted I am by temptations. I never knew how bad a heart I had. Who's talking? One of the world's greatest missionaries, who suddenly saw revelation of himself and his weakness and his frailty. I never knew how wicked, how bad a heart I had. I knew that I loved God and I loved his work and I desired to serve him in all things. And I value and precious his lovely name. But often I'm tempted to think that one so full of sin as I cannot even be a child of God at all. He said, please, friends, pray that the Lord will keep me from my sin, will sanctify me wholly and will use me largely in his service. I listened to the, to the pitiful heart cry of this missionary and other missionaries, and I realized that they fought the same battle. Others who say, I've walked with God for so long, I'm too intelligent to have to face such immature kinds of temptation. I should have passed this plane long ago. You can walk with God for 25 years and suddenly be cast down into a kind of temptation and face a battle in your life that you thought you would never be called upon to fight. You thought you were too far along the road. Have you fully persuaded yourself that you want to sell out to God, that you want to resist all the pressures of this age? You want to become a true overcomer, yet in spite of your resolutions, your determined will, your keen desire, your praying, your fasting, your seeking, you still must honestly admit that sin often overwhelms you. Things that you despise, you end up doing. You feel almost like it is an inevitable force that pushes you into moves and actions and indulgences of the mind and the body. Things that you hate. And then you wind up perplexed, your soul in turmoil, and you end up with an indescribable wretchedness and despair. Paul the Apostle knew something about this kind of wretchedness. Romans. What I hate, that do I. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. 
Paul was seeking a definition of power over sin. Say what you will, I believe Paul faced the same battle that you and I face. He said, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul was a wretched man until God gave him the same spirit of revelation of power over sin in his life. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, I don't want to get into a deep theological discussion about the two natures and about the deep meanings to be found here. Suffice to say that I believe Paul the Apostle is speaking for himself about his own personal battle and his own quest for deliverance and power over sin. And from backsliders and from saints of all ages, from David Wilkerson, from Hudson Taylor, from the lips of every dying prophet of God, from Paul the Apostle included, this cry has gone out through every generation. Where is my power over sin? I have seen my sin and my bondage. Who shall deliver me from my wretchedness? Who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, my friend, if you have not yet fought this battle, you are still an immature Christian. This is a battle of prophets. This is a battle of those who seek the deeper things of God. This is the battle of those who want to go all the way with the Lord. And if you've been walking with God, this message already comes very, very close to describing the very battle you fight right now. I thank God that there is deliverance. Man does not have to be a slave to sin. You do not have to live your life in bondage to the habits of a sinful urge. There is a way out. There is deliverance. There is power over all sin. Not enough for me to tell you that all power over sin is in Christ Jesus. No definition of this power will work in your life and mine until we learn how to get this power out of him into us. Listen to what Hudson Taylor said. He said, all the time I felt assured that there was in Jesus Christ all I needed. All power over sin, all victory in him was the richness and fatness of heaven. But the practical question was this. How to get it out of him. He was truly rich, but I was poor. He was strong, but I was weak. I knew full well that there was in the root, the stem, all the abundant fatness. But how to get it into my puny little branch was the question. Yes, my friend, Jesus Christ has all the power over sin. And I want you to know something else. Guidance, divine guidance is a person. It is Jesus. Guidance is a person. Victory over sin is a person. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But how do we tap that power for our own lives? When a man faces a battle and he wants a definition over sin, what does he do? Does he pray more, fast more often, make resolutions, try to be better? So we try to work up feelings of righteousness and seek something of an outward holiness? Hudson Taylor did. He said, I prayed, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions. I read the Bible more diligently, but with all, all without avail. Every day, almost hour, every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. I knew that if I could just abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not find out how. My friends, absolute power over all sin belongs only to Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is he who has come to destroy the works of the devil. All our power over sin depends entirely on our faith in his promise to live his life through us. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He didn't say, I'm being crucified every day. I don't believe Paul died daily. I believe he died a thousand times a day. What he's trying to say is get Paul and Paul out of the way so Jesus can live his resurrected life through me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, not of Paul the Apostle. Paul didn't have any faith, didn't even try to find it. Paul never looked for faith, he never tried to strive for it. He said, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You know, they doesn't have an ounce of faith. I haven't even been looking for it. I've never been trying to find faith because I've been letting Jesus exercise his faith through me. He knows the Father better than I. 
by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul the Apostle found that his power over sin came by a full and complete faith that the life he lived in the flesh was actually Jesus Christ living through him and fighting off the enemy. This is what Hudson Taylor found. This is what I found. But how to get my faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. Hudson Taylor went outside and looked at a tree. He saw the branch and he tried to figure out how that branch got the life out. He said the branch didn't move, never did it think. It just stayed on the branch. The very fact that it was in, the vine just rested. There remaineth yet a rest of the children of God. He said, I will never leave thee. There is your rest. You can strive in vain to rest in him. You don't have to strive to rest. For he's not promised to leave you or to forsake you. So you accept that and appropriate it by faith. Now hear me before I close. The most damning sin of all is unbelief. We make God a liar when we will not take him at his word. We lack power over sin because we toy with our unbelief. He has promised to quicken us in the moment of temptation, make a way of escape, and I've found what that way of escape is. When you really believe God's word, when you see the mighty power of Jesus Christ within you, when the moment of temptation comes, the way of escape is a quickening spirit sent by God through the Holy Spirit that will last as long as your temptation so that you can bear it. And every time I see it coming and you can sense it, the enemy comes in. We're not ignorant of his devices. He begins to plague us. And suddenly I start perceiving Christ. And I believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a power of perception. Paul kept saying, oh, that you might know that your eyes may be open, that you may perceive. And this is a power of perception that Christ is here in the same spirit that raised him from the dead. And I picture that the corpse laying there in the tomb, the mighty spirit of God coming down into that tomb, picking up that body, that corpse, breathing life. And I see him rise in a new dimension, walking out of that tomb. And I try to picture all that happened in that tomb. And I picture the same spirit that raised him from the dead suddenly in my moment of temptation coming and picking me right up, right up. And suddenly in a new dimension, Satan cannot touch me. Satan cometh and hath nothing in me. Now that doesn't make me a bit better. I don't even try to be a bit better. And I don't fight anymore. I rest in his power, allowing Jesus Christ to live through us. And oh, how ignorant we are of this mighty power within us. Everybody talks about some storehouse somewhere. I've heard preachers say, oh, if I could only tap that storehouse. Here it is. It is within us. You don't have to reach out. God hath been pleased that in him should dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. When I stop to think of all the power he has given us, all power over sin belongs to him. You do not fight this battle anymore, my friends. Resign and commit it to the Lord and allow Jesus to quicken you. The same spirit that was in Christ shall be in you. The same spirit that raised him from the dead. You cannot say what will be will be. You cannot indulge in unbelief and expect to get victory in your life. You've got to stand up and declare to be to your own soul. Christ has power over this sin. Christ lives in me. Christ in me will deliver me. Christ in me will set me free. I can't fight it. It's too big for me. But Jesus has the power, so I'll rest in him. And I found a simple but sure solution. With this, I close. In my life for power over sin. I've discovered the secret of personal of power over personal sin in my life. You hear it well. It's this simple. Stay close to Jesus. Love him. Trust him. Believe in him. Commune with him. Draw an eye to him and he'll draw an eye to you. The answer to all power of sin is to become possessed with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm a Jesus-possessed man. Possessed. Hmm. Who are these that keep backsliding? 
Who are these who grow cold and indifferent? Who are these that revert to narcotics and their sinful ways? Who are these who, like dogs, return to their vomit to wallow? Who are these that moan and groan that they can't help themselves, that they're being forced to sin? They are those who have lost their first love. They are those who walk afar off, those who dabble in the world and who pray only in a crisis. They are not lovers of Jesus. I tell you that lovers of Jesus have found there's victory over all sin. Lovers of Jesus learn just three promises. If a man will take just three promises, any three promises in the book, and stand on it and believe it, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And rest on his word. Exercise the power of Jesus within us. You too will find your definition of power over sin. I was told last night with this, I close. Anymore, when a drug addict comes to me, he says he has no more power. When I walk the streets, whether it be a prostitute, a drug addict, alcoholic, we round them up from the Bowery and God sets them free. I lay hands on them. It's though Dave Wilson steps right out of his body and stands beside and watches the Holy Spirit minister to Christ. I just yield my lips and pray that Christ will cause that living water. You know, the Bible said, greater works than these shall you do. Who does the greater works? It's Christ himself who's come back. He's still doing the works. Only he's doing greater works now than he did then because he comes back using our bodies. He has come back. All he wants is a body. And I pray and God sets them free. And then I step back into the body and rejoice and praise him for what he did through a yielded body. And God wants you to step aside in the moment of temptation. He wants you to step out of the body. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I have a prophetic word this morning. Uh, it's been quite a while since the Lord has entrusted me to bring a prophetic message, but this is very strong in my heart. I want you to turn to Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, my message in one hour Everything's going to change in one hour. 24th chapter of Isaiah. I'm going to read just the first few verses. And then you leave your Bible open because I'm going to keep coming back to this. It's the prophecy is all here. It's not my prophecy. It's, I, it's the Lord's prophecy given through Isaiah, his holy prophet. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste, and turns it upside down, and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, and with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, the seller, as with the lender, the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so the giver of usury. Land shall be emptied and spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. Father, in love and brokenness, I come to this congregation with something that you placed on my heart, something prophesied many, many years ago, aimed at this very generation and this time. Lord, I pray that you awaken our hearts, that, that we would not tremble, we would not fear, but we would trust your word to bring strength to us. Now, Lord, come upon me by your Holy Spirit. Let me speak the word of the living God with confidence and faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, through the prophet Isaiah said, a time is coming. God said, I'm going to turn everything upside down. And the scripture makes it very clear. It says, behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. There's a sudden judgment coming 
to this world. And it's at the door. And I want you to hear what the prophet Isaiah is saying. It's not my message. Now, if you're tied to this world, if you're in love with the things of this world, then you are not walking with the Lord. You're not wanting to hear. You will not want to hear this. And you may want to just cast it aside and say, well, I'll endure this message. It, 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 and even if you are a born-again Christian, if you love the Lord and you're close to him, if you didn't believe that this is the pure word of God, there may be a tendency not to take it serious. But this is the word of God. It is not man's prophecy. There are a lot of prophecies going forth in the world, and, and they are, uh, I don't know whether you would call them scripturally based or not, but this is scripture. This is the living word of God. And if you believe this is the pure word of God, then you have to open your heart to what the prophet Isaiah has to say this morning. In one hour, the world is going to change, the scripture says. In fact, when you get to Revelation 8th chapter, John warned in one day, death and mourning, yea, in one hour, an utter burning and judgment will come. That's the 18th chapter of Revelation. And it confirms that this is going to happen. Jesus said it's going to be when all men cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. A sudden, unexpected destruction comes from the hand of the Lord. Isaiah warns that there, he mentions a city. In fact, a number of prophets do, but most uh, eminent Bible scholars, and I've checked through my library, and they believe, as I do, that this prophecy that we're hearing this morning from Isaiah is, at, is, is directed to this generation. And in just a moment, I'll enlarge on that and tell you why I believe we can pinpoint it into our very generation, our time. In one day, in one hour, and he says at that time, there, there was going to be a great burning. Now, secular prophets and those in homeland security, whether it's in the United States or England or Germany, all over the world now, they, they are saying that, that there is going to come a nuclear accident or a nuclear holocaust coming to a city. They often name New York City. You, you know what's happened here. We lived through the 9-11 experience. And you could look out of the apartment, especially where we are, and you could see the burning and see the fire and the smoke ascending to heaven. And a few weeks ago, remember the eruption of the steam pipe and uh, the earth opened up and swallowed a truck and you saw pictures of people running everywhere and they're screaming, is this it, is this it? They're thinking nuclear. And the scripture says, if, when you go through... I. Isaiah, the 24th chapter, it, it says that the gates are going to be dissolved. The gates are going to be uh, devastated. That means the exits and entrances. We don't know where it is. The city is named and a burning and a fire is mentioned here. I've been prophesying for a number of years that uh, of something I saw when I was on the street and in, <clears throat> on uh, Broadway and 42nd Street. And it's come back to me many, many times of a thousand bur fires burning in this particular city we, in which we live. But you see, I don't know where it is. He doesn't name the city, but he does say that there, there, there is going to be a sudden destruction that's going to change everything. The world is going to change in one hour. The church is going to change in one hour. And we as individuals are going to change in one hour. Now, this message is not to frighten because if, if you're confident that you're saved and under the blood of Christ and redeemed, you know that anything like this happens, it's instant glory. We pass from life into death. And like the Apostle Paul said, we should be of this mindset that we thank God for this world. We thank God for our life. But our preference is to go and be with Christ. That should be the desire in your heart. The scripture said the fear of death is a dominion. It's a terror. And 
Paul said, you've lived all your life that way. But he said, God says he doesn't want you to live that way. He wants to deliver us from the fear of death. And if we lose the fear of death through trusting in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not fear no matter what happens, what the newscast is, what anybody says, or a message such as this. You, you will only be moved to awaken to what the, the Lord says to do. And let, let me not get ahead of myself here. We don't know where this is going to happen. First of all, the hour is going to come when the whole world is going to change. Now, eminent Bible scholars believe that chapter 24 and 25 of Isaiah have to do with our time this very day. A sudden cataclysmic event is going to strike. And the Bible, Isaiah says, the lofty, this is... 26 verse 5, the lofty, meaning the proud city, will be laid low even to the ground. Bible, then, according to the prophet, there is utter chaos. And folks, you can go out in the street here on this Sunday afternoon, go right outside the door on a sunny day, and say, how could it happen that in one hour there could be such confusion where government can't do anything about it. Societal agencies can't do anything about it because even when 9-11 struck this city, they came from all over the world. They poured in from all the United States, firemen, police officers, and helpers, and uh, there was uh, armies of people wanting to help. But folks, this cataclysmic event makes very, is made very clear in the scripture it's going to be beyond human ability to cope with. And, and even now, we, we listen to our secular prophets, and they they talk about trying to prepare. But there, there is there's coming a day that in one hour society changes, a whole world changes. The Bible says the merchants will weep and weep and wail and cry because no one is buying their merchandise. They are all sellers and no buyers. This past week, the <clears throat> Director or the CEO of a large fund put his 142 foot yacht for sale. His 16 bedroom house in Aspen went up for sale because his high risk funds are fading and he's in deep trouble and it happened overnight. And, and now all of these risk funds, mortgage companies going bankrupt left and right. And, and we are facing an incredible monster economic upheaval. I've been warning about that. I stood in this pulpit a year ago, this Sunday, I think it was, or, or within one or two Sundays, warning about the mortgage market and telling people if you're flipping houses and you don't know how to do that, you're not a real estate agent, get out. We warned about that. And because... You say, well, why warn? What's the purpose of that? Why don't you just wait till it happens? Why live on any kind of anxiety? Why put this burden upon us? But remember what Jesus said when he first saw the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, there's going to be a, this city is going to burn to the ground. And he said, I'm telling you now so that when it happens, you'll believe. You'll believe that there is a God who so loved you. He warns you. And, and he, he said, that it, there's going, this, 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 city is going to the ground and there won't be one stone left upon another in the temple. And Jesus warned. He said, now, I'm warning you for a reason. So that when it happens, when you see these things come up, you will understand that you were loved. And, and Paul the apostle, when he's talking about the sudden destruction, he called that information light. He said, you're members of the body walking in light. You're getting Holy Ghost insight. He said, you're not in the darkness. You won't walk in darkness. So that when these sudden things come and, and there's panic all around you, there's going to be something happen to you by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be something that quickens you and say, well, my God warned me. There were true, two word, true words that came forth from the pulpit and we were, we were warned. Even though in this day of prosperity, nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But folks, it is here, and I'll tell you why this message is being brought forth this morning before I close. He said the dreams are going to fade. 
He, he goes on to say that the music is going to fade, of, of the zithers or the guitars, and, and the, the, uh, there's, there's going to be such a change. Everything is going to change in this world in one hour. If, if there were a nuclear attack on Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, any city in Israel, I told you about the Samson option, and, and they have such a radar system, they have such protective uh, equipment that as soon as a missile's released toward Israel, within moments, they have about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, according to some experts, and retaliatory missiles would hit and strike and wipe out every enemy of Israel. Folks, I'm going to talk to you in just a, a moment about why I believe that the, the, that the prophet Isaiah is talking about our day. First of all, by the growing number of prophets warning of an apocalyptic moment coming. Now, when I talk about prophets, I'm not talking about just church prophets. I'm talking about secular prophets because God uses secular prophets. These are experts. These are scientists. And remember in the scripture, God said of, of Assyria, Assyria is my rod against Israel to correct them. In other words, Assyria is doing my will. I am speaking through Assyria to my people. And remember also about Cyrus. The scripture said of Cyrus, he's a heathen king. And when you get to Amos, Amos the prophet said, Cyrus is, God speaking through him said, Cyrus is my shepherd and he's doing my bidding. So when, when you hear all of these secular uh, scientists and all of these these are not church people. These are not religious people. They're, they are saying it's at the door. Uh, what about the sensuality? What about all of this nonchalance? What about this racing for money and gold and greed? Wall Street has become the greediest source of, of, of vile corruption in man's history. They have taken this nation into such risk and such depth, there, debt, there is no way out of it. And we live right at the foot of, we, it, it's right at the, <clears throat> just blocks away from where I'm preaching this morning. And the second reason, you, you see, what I'm preaching this morning is mild compared to what I hear now. Is that right or wrong? What you hear in the news and what you hear constantly fed so that we just want to turn it off. But you see, God moves. God moves in. <clears throat> these, these are the warning times when prophets are speaking because the scripture says the Lord <clears throat> will do nothing until he speaks through his prophets, through Amos. God said, I don't do anything until I warn through my prophets. And the second reason why... I believe we can assume that what Isaiah is warning speaks to our generation. God always moves in judgment. He always acts when the cup of violence overflows. Violence. Now, folks, let me speak plainly to you from the depths of my soul. I'm not a prophet. I've never claimed to be a prophet. I'm a watchman. Just one of many. But listen to me now. There is no greater violence in the sight of God than the violence of pedophiles. Those who are raping children. Those who are stealing children right off the streets and taking them to, to the Far East and putting them in brothels in India and all the, the Far East. And, and here in the United States, an entire church denomination paying hundreds of millions of dollars to settle lawsuits because their little children were sodomized. Folks, when you turn to Dafar and you find that hundreds and even thousands of little children were shedded to death. 
When you think of the thousands and thousands of babies aborted in the United States and around the world, and that blood cries from the ground, and the Bible says God destroyed Noah's age because the earth was filled with violence. And God said, I can't handle it anymore. I can't take it. I will not take it. And he was patient for 120 years of strong, faithful preaching, a prophetic word. And then God saw. And folks, I believe now, think of the, the murdering in our schools, the, the terrorizing of our children. You can hard. What are we doing? Getting hardened to the news? Does it not move us anymore? I can tell you it moves the heart of God. And I believe that blood cries from the ground. How long do you think God will endure? How long do you think God will put up with this? Even here now on the Internet, a pedophile is taking pictures and, and telling pedophiles where to go to find the children where it's easiest to pick up a child. And he's allowed to do it and had, can't be stopped. Folks, that's all going to change. This is all going to change in one hour. Secondly, sudden destruction... <clears throat> When it comes, is going to change the church. In one hour, the church is going to change. It's going to change dead churches. It's going to change live churches. The prophet pictures a great shaking as though God took an olive tree that had already been harvested, and he begins to shake it. In other words, there's been a harvest, but there's still, God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. I'm going to turn everything upside down, according to the prophet. In this time of shaking, though, something is going to happen that's so incredible. If you have your Bibles open, I want you to go to verse 14. Now, before you do that, don't get ahead of me, please. Look this way. Now, remember, this is a time... Of, of cataclysmic devastation. This is a time that's so incredibly dark. This is a time of fire. And in the middle of that, what about God's people? What's happening in the church? The apostasy is going to change overnight. Everything that we see that is Wrong in the church of Jesus Christ is going to change. But in the house of God, there's going to be a revival. And I want you to see it, folks. And if you, it, it, this one, I, I saw it and began to pray over it and began to study and do my research on this. See, this is not, I didn't get along with God and pray and say, God, talk to me. Put in my head what's going to happen. I have people all over the world, wherever I travel, say, Brother Dave, you speak of prophetic. What's, what's next? What's coming? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'll go to my Bible. If God speaks it through his word, then I believe it, and then I'll preach it. So I see this, and it makes me shout. I know what's coming, and you know what's coming. But folks think God's interest is in his church, in the church of Jesus Christ, his overcoming church. And the Bible said in the middle of this, there's going to be a song rise up. From the islands of the sea, from the uttermost parts of the world, there's going to be a song rise up in the middle of all of this. Look at it, verse 14. Then shall they lift up, first, verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there's going to be a great shaking. What's happening during the shaking? Verse 13, verse 14. Then they, in other words, they shall lift up their voice, they shall sing, for the majesty of the Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify you the Lord in the fires. Did you hear it? <laughs> there should be an amen coming from the glory of your soul. Because in the middle of the fire, God's going to have a people who are not in panic. 
God is going to have a people that are going to praise the majesty of Almighty God. He said, in the fires you will sing. There's a song coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're not going down. We're going up. We are going up. There shall be a song in the midst of the fire. <clears throat> Verse 16, for the, from the uttermost part of the earth, have we heard what? Not weeping, not groaning, not murmuring, not complaining, not agonizing. But you hear a song coming from China, and then you hear it from India. You hear it coming out of the tribes of Africa, out of Darfur, out of every nation. It's coming from every island of the sea. It's coming from the United States and Canada, South America, the whole world, for the uttermost part of the world. I hear a song, the prophet said. I hear a, I hear people who are facing calamity. I hear people that uh, seemingly have no hope, and there's a song. There's a choir. We heard over 150 voices here this morning singing. Can you imagine the great sound that was coming out of the 150? Can you imagine millions and millions of people around the world singing the song when this hour comes? It's coming in the darkest time of all. I, I, I believe that, <clears throat> that something's going to happen among our youth, especially college students. Do you understand that for, for the past 10 years especially, our children, our young people are going into colleges and their faith is being robbed? That ungodly atheistic teachers and professors have our young people as prisoners for three, four, five, and six years. And they keep bombarding them till there's no faith. They, they leave believing there is no God. Till like in Sweden, 80% of the people now say that the population that there's no God. Don't believe in God. 20% believe in God. And many, many students. And folks, I believe that's going to change because in one hour, when everybody is waking and when the world is shaking and trembling, those professors are going to be looking for somebody to give them a word. Prosperity preachers are going to get their Bibles out looking for something to say to the people saying, what's happened? Why didn't you warn us? But I believe that in that time, everything in college is going to change. Oh, yes. All the survivors. You see, this is not, I'm not talking about the end of the world. There's still ahead. There's, the, 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 things are going to change in one hour. But there's still, we're talking about in the future beyond that, the Antichrist. And, but you see, the Antichrist can't come to power until there's chaos. It has to come out of chaos. Hitler came out of chaos. The Antichrist is going to come out of a chaotic world where he, there, there is something of wisdom. There's something given to him, a demonic power that brings people some kind of hope. I'm talking about the secular world. But folks, this is all about to change. Now the Bible says we as individuals are going to change. In one hour, we're going to have our focus in life changed, our entire focus. We will no longer be obsessing about our own problems and adversities. We won't be, we won't be focused on me. We won't be focused on our problems as serious as they are and, and as challenging as they may be. God, it's very clear. This will not be our focus. That's all going to be changed. Everything that was once dear to us. It's, it's no longer going to have value it's, it, other than those things that are of the spirit and of love and of Christ. Things that we held dear are, are going to be held and, and absolutely are going to vanish. By this, meaning the calamity, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged when he turns all the stones into dust. This is Isaiah 27, 9. He said, I'm going to take all the idols. And he said, by this, in other words, this great cataclysmic event is going to bring down all the idols. All the idols are going to be crushed to stone, is what the Bible says. Here's the promise from the book of Isaiah, 27th chapter. He said, in that day, all the idols 
will be trampled to dust. They're not going to, the last thing the world's going to be talking about is sports. I have nothing in sports. I like sports. I'm a football fan. But, you know, the Bible says it's going to be good. They're not going to be any more $250 million settlement for these people in a starving world. He said it's all going to change. It goes even deeper than that. Let me find it here in the scripture. It shall be, here's where we're going to be in a level field. Listen to this very please. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with his mistress, or the buyer and the seller, as with the lender and the buyer. Everything will be brought to a same level. Whether it's presidents, world leaders, those in poverty, all going to face the same struggles, the same conditions, <clears throat> nothing will, <clears throat> there'll be no respect of persons. Are you ready for some comfort? <laughs> I said, are you ready for some comfort? Yes. Folks, I don't like to preach like this. For the last Six weeks, I've preached nothing but grace. I risk people getting mad. Every time I've had to preach much like this, people leave. But one day I stand before God. And he said, if you see these things coming and you don't warn, the blood's on your hand. And I read that and tremble. There should be no one that comes to Times Square Church surprised. Should, you don't sit around waiting for things to happen. But let me tell you what Paul the Apostle said. I want you to follow this very closely before I close. Paul said, he has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, whether we, we, we will live together with him. He said, comfort yourself. He, he's talking about sudden destruction. He's talking about time that we're going to be with the Lord. And he said, I want you to comfort one another. Comfort one another. And he said, whether we live or die. And folks, that's where we have to come to right now. You, you, you watch the news in the next 30 days, and especially the next two weeks. Yeah, listen to, to what's happening to the economy. Listen, listen and, and just remember God speaking, not to make you afraid, but to prepare your heart. He said, you're to put on the breastplate of faith. This is Paul the Apostle said, in these times when we live under the threat of a sudden destruction or the knowledge of a sudden destruction coming on the earth, when, when, when this has been told to us and when we see it and we hear it, he, he said, you're not to tremble, you're not to sorrow as the world sorrows. He said, no. He, he said, you go about comforting one another and speak to one another, saying, live or die, we're the Lord's. Now, it comes down to this, going to your friends, going to the body of Christ, went after the other and shake hands and look right in the eye and say, live or die, we're the Lord's. That's what Paul said. You're going to encourage one another and say, we live or die, we will go and live with Christ. We are headed for eternal life in Christ. Folks, I'm asking God, and I, I more and more, you say, well, you can come to that because you're old man now. But you see, I'm coming to a place now where I'm not going to live in fear. I don't live in fear. I want to be here in the United States. I want to be here in New York City if anything happens to this city. I want to be here in the middle of it. And I don't want the fear of death to have dominion over me. And you can't have freedom. You can't have freedom until you comfort yourself with the Word of God, saying, I will, whatever happens, if it happens tomorrow, bless God, I'm going to be shouting on the streets of glory with all the saints of God. I'm going to pass from death into life. This, we're not to live in fear. We're not to live in bondage. 
You say, well, Brother Dave, you already put us in fear, and now you're trying to get us out of it. No, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. I, I, my message today is that there's a song coming out of this. And if you leave this building, if you leave this building discouraged, if you walk out of here and say that's nothing but gloom and doom, yes, it is on a human level. But on a spiritual level, it's life eternal. It's life. And I just have a secret thought in my heart. It's probably just David Wilkerson's thoughts. But I have a feeling, just as before 9-11, the Holy Spirit moved in this church and other congregations and warned us there were moments of silence. Sometime 15 minutes we sat in this church just before the blast. And God was speaking to us not to be afraid. And I, it's going to be different this time. I believe that if something is going to happen in this city or wherever it happens, the saints of God are going to be quickened by the Holy Spirit and there's going to be some singing and shouting and praising of God to encourage the body to strengthen their spirit. Now get up on your feet. I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Folks, I've got the Holy Ghost all over me right now. I have the Holy Spirit upon my soul. He wants to come upon you. The Holy Spirit wants to quicken you. Take the fear out of your heart. You young people that are in the choir, the young people that are listening to me right now, there is a future. There, the whole world thinks there's no future. Folks, this is just the beginning of our future. This is just the beginning of our future. Hallelujah. I feel good. There are going to be a lot of people listening to this tape, tuned it out too quick. They turned it off. They should have stayed. And listen to the praises and the shouts of God's people in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. There shall be a song. Somebody asked you this afternoon or tomorrow or next week, what did Pastor Dave preach? You say, revival. A song in a hard time. And I've got to say this in closing. Listen very carefully, please. You're to sing in your present fire, in your adver ad adversity, in your hard time, financial, whatever it may be. You've got to get a song. You say, does God expect me to sing? Folk, I don't care what it is. There should be that little quiet. There's something very quiet and steadfast in the soul that sings, great is our God. See, he said they're going to sing about the majesty of God. Great is our God. Folks, I walk these streets and I sing. I sing in spite of, of, of crises. I sing in spite of all those things. There's something God puts in the heart. And you've got to get your song now. That'll be too late. Get it now. Get a hold of your song. There's a song in the night, but there's a song in the fire. Some of you are in a fire. The Bible says, build up your faith. The Apostle Paul said, put on the breastplate of hope, uh, uh, of faith and love and hope. Oh, praise God for the hope that is in our hearts. Now, we have a, a space here in the front of the church. We, we refer to it as the altar, another place to meet God. And I invite you, if you're here this morning, and God has spoken to you. You see, uh, God's not interested in you changing your life through fear, but through hope. And that's what this meeting is all about, hope. And you're here this morning, and your hope 
has been staggered because you're going through a crisis in your life. And you say, well, Brother Dave, everybody's got some kind of a crisis. But I'm talking about a, a real serious thing that, that only God could give you a song. And there's been some, we call it the blues or depression. If you're standing here with the sound of my voice in the annex upstairs here, wherever we're at in this audience, and you need a touch an absolute touch of God. You need the spirit of fear to be broken in you so you can walk out of this building. Maybe that fear is because you're not walking with Christ as you did or should. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you walked in here and you've never known what it is to have what people call a new birth or you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I invite you to get out of your seat. Upstairs, wherever you are, and even the balcony, in the annex, you can go to the lobby, and they'll show you how to get down here in the front of this church, and we will pray for you. You can come even while I'm talking. Just get out of your seat, up the balcony, go to the stairs on either side, and come down. And we're going to believe God for a, a tremendous uh, change. Everything's a change in our. This can change you in the next five minutes. There can be a change in your life, and the Lord can cleanse you, change your direction, and bring hope and life to your whole, your body, soul, mind, and spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that you walk through this congregation, move through this congregation, and find everyone that needs a miracle, a life-changing miracle, and those who would believe with us, would believe with us for that change in Jesus' name. And while they're singing, just get out of your seat. Up in the balcony, come and join us here. We'll pray and we'll believe God for you and with you. If you don't know Christ, if you've drifted from Christ, follow these that are coming. Now, there are some, maybe many of you here this morning, worried and fretting. Pastor Dave, what do I, what do, I do in the future if some of these things you're talking about even begin to happen? What do we do? What about my house? My, mortgage, all of these things. The Lord comes to us with a message that casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Can, can you imagine a God who has flung into the cosmos, not just this one uh, world that we're living in, not this one galaxy, but you understand that there are millions and billions of galaxies beyond ours, the the Hubble uh, telescope has discovered not just uh, billions of, they're talking about billions of universes. Can you imagine? Endless. And a God who can keep all of that in order. Can't he keep our lives in order? My goodness. And, and, and we have preached faith so long. We have toyed with faith. We have imagined we have faith. We have talked and preached and, and, and tried to test it and all. But, folks, that it, it is time. It is time. And the only reason I can think God would have me do this this morning is that you and I get a hold of some life-changing faith that no matter what happens, somehow God will deliver his people. And if, if, if we... If, Folks, how do you how do you explain the 16 Korean Presbyterians right now in the hands of the Afghan uh, terror, uh, Taliban? Two have been murdered, and then then we say, well, you know, the fiery furnace and the lion's den—they're all delivered, and God's not appointed.